to be uh, speaking with uh, the CAPER group. Uh, this is, of course, an organization that I hold uh, near and dear uh, to my heart, <laughs> having uh, come through the ranks of, um, of training in both academic astroneurology and, and more specifically pancreatology. And this was a talk that I had um, given to a group of GI fellows uh, about two and a half, three years ago. But I think many of the lessons are um, really, uh, I think, important for anybody who's looking to uh, develop an academic career uh, in not only really gastroenterology, but also pancreatology. And certainly we can, we'll talk probably more specifically about that as we go through this. Um, I do want this to be very interactive, uh, and I do, and I'm very mindful of everyone's time, recognizing that uh, today is actually a very beautiful day outside, and I'm sure people want to get outside and not have to spend their whole day on yet another uh, web conference. So um, uh, please do uh, interrupt me if you have any questions, or you know, and I might go through some of these slides a little bit faster than others. So can everyone see my slides? Yes. Uh, okay. So. Uh, you know, as in any talk, uh, let's always remember that uh, there is a learning pyramid. Uh, and uh, of course, I want this to be very casual. And uh, let's remember that when we discuss things, we're more likely to retain what we've learned uh, rather than uh, going through just a, a simple boring uh, lecture or having to read a lot of material. So uh, please do ask questions if they come up. Um, so, you know, I think uh, also the other thing I should probably underscore is that my overall experiences may be more applicable to the clinical as opposed to the laboratory researcher. So this is a little bit more of a disclaimer, disclosure statement. Uh, and, uh, and I just threw in some cartoons uh, as, I, as I enjoyed these and, and thought it uh, very uh, applicable to uh, the clinical versus the laboratory researcher. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that, uh, you know, academic su success is something that anybody can achieve. I just think it's something that we all need to plan for in, in order to achieve it. Uh, I don't know if folks know what this is, uh, but it's actually the Sahara Desert. And yes, that's snow in the Sahara Desert. And the reason I show this is because uh, it actually happens every once in a while. Uh, it's an extremely rare event, but every couple of years, there'll actually be a fairly decent amount of snowfall in parts of the Sahara Desert. And, but the problem is it goes away real quick, right? So I, at the end of the day, I don't want your, your careers to sort of match the snow in the Sahara Desert uh, analogy, right? Uh, this should really not be a rare event. I think you all have the abilities and skills to achieve this. So let's talk about what does it take to be academically successful? You know, and I think it's really uh, academic success lies at the confluence of many factors, including, you know, mentorship, guidance and opportunity, passion, motivation, dedication, efficiency and productivity, knowledge, lear learning and skills, environment, institution, leadership, time slash protection, luck <laughs> and timing, and of course, hard work, effort and persistence. So really, you know, I think academic success, if you had to sort of come up with the best Venn diagram, I, I think it lies really at the confluence of all of these factors. Uh, and, I, and I don't think we can discount any one of these. Now, I, I, of course, not everybody has all access maybe to all of these elements uh, at all points during their career. Uh, but I think if you, you know, if you at least are focused on what it's going to take and recognize these individual spheres, I think as you move forward, uh, you know, you'll begin to realize what is it that I need to really be successful. And, and I think that these are all things that uh, are, are, are going to be critical factors, some of which are more related to ourselves and others are related to sort of our overall environment and the people we work with. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's always the iceberg illusion, right? So success is an iceberg. What people see is what it <laughs> uh, they see the success, but they don't see the underbelly of the iceberg, right? Uh, you know, we're always only really seeing the tip of the iceberg. But when you think about the underside of it, there's all, all the elements that we all had to deal with in our, in our pathway to success, everything from persistence, failure, sacrifice, disappointment, discipline, hard work, dedication. You know, I, all of these things are so common in, in academic uh, medicine. Uh, and, and a lot of fields, frankly, uh, you know, nobody, we always only really see what's up top, but it's just as important to remember that all of this is going on at the bottom and some of this can sometimes bog us down, but we need to keep in mind that uh, this is really what we're hoping to achieve. 
Oh, you know, what I say really are my top 12 tips for GI fellows. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm going to probably go through these a little bit more quickly. And certainly you guys can ask more questions as we go along. But, I, you know, again, this was sort of geared towards GI fellows. And I think many in the audience are uh, probably GI fellows or maybe GI surgeons, um, as well as basic scientists. But I think a lot of these are still relatively applicable. So one is commit to a subspecialty early. Find excellent mentors, meet and talk with them frequently. Build a foundation of research skills and resources. This is in fact very, very important. Because once you have a foundation, you can always build in any direction uh, and in any area. When you're a fellow, you wanna pick a project or projects that can be completed and published in one to two years. I, I think that's very important. Now this may be more applicable to a clinical researcher than a basic scientist, but nonetheless still important. You want to publish at least one original paper uh, before leaving your fellowship program. Remember that cognitive is forever, procedural is fleeting, so don't worry about how many colonoscopies your friends at other programs are doing. Uh, that's very important, right? In other words, we're always, I think the, the energy and effort we put into developing our cognitive skills, you know, our fund of knowledge is, that's really what's going to last us forever, right? But remember that whatever we're learning procedure-wise, uh, may be very relevant today, but may not be relevant in five to 10 years. So, uh, so think about that a little bit. Uh, apply for one grant at some stage, even if it does not get funded, as you will get practice and can apply for something bigger in the future. Even if you want to do something else other than clinical medicine, 20% or more of your time than an academic career is for you. I, you know, this was something that actually one of my very senior mentors during my time at the Brigham told me, and I really found that to be very relevant um, because I think, you know, a lot of, we've had wonderful people come through training who are very talented, had an excellent array of both clinical and research skills, but we're never able to sort of translate that into an academic career because they got too caught up in sort of focusing a lot on dollars uh, and not really what they wanted to do as a career, right? You know, I, I think there's jobs and there's careers. So, you know, if you see yourself even wanting to do something else for part of the time that you spend, then I think an academic career sort of makes more sense for you. Follow the overall forces shaping gastroenterology, and that could, you could replace gastroenterology with anything, pancreatology, dermatology, you know, sports medicine, I, really any area, any field. And think about how you, see, how you will sell yourself or fit in with your new employer division institution. Remember, it takes all kinds of individuals with different skill sets to make academic uh, divisions succeed. So we need clinicians, we need leaders, we need scholars, we need innovators, we need entrepreneurs, we need people who are experts in safety, people who understand regulatory, et cetera. All of these things are needed for uh, academic divisions and departments to be successful. So, I, you know, I don't want anyone to walk away from this talk thinking that I must be a, you know, an academic clinical researcher, such as the individual giving this talk right now, or a, you know, a big name basic scientist, but we really need people who can do all of these things. And, you know, throughout my first now 10 or 11 years in, in academic gastroenterology, I've realized how important it is to actually have other people who do other things working around us all the time. It, it makes us better, it helps our divisions and enterprises run more smoothly, and, uh, and we really need everybody. You know, I, yeah, medicine is so complicated, you know, and without good people doing all of these things around us, I don't think any, any one of us can actually succeed. And remember that location is important, but take the long view. So, uh, you know, I always say this to sort of my fellows who are graduating at any level, whether they're, uh, you know, G, regular GI fellows or advanced endoscopy fellows, pancreas fellows, Remember that uh, at smaller places, it's easy to be somebody, but in bigger places, it's harder to be somebody. But once you are somebody, you can go anywhere, right? I, and, and I think that we have to think about that sometimes when we have to make decisions about, especially the first few steps in our career, right? Because we may not have a lot of choices up front, but I think that with time, certainly, there are a lot more opportunities that will come your way. And remember that protected time and support are more important than money in the long term, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. Okay. I'm an excellent mentor. So, you know, if I had to give examples, I'm sorry, did somebody have a, qu have a uh, question? Doctor, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, if you're yeah, going sure. back to the last slide, and the no. first point that you brought up, like committing yeah. to a subspeciality early, uh, you highlighted yeah. it right on the top. So, right. what tips do you have for some of us very early in the career? Can you give examples from your own career, like how you picked pancreatology? 
Yeah, so I, maybe maybe I, I can come back to that because I think some of them in the next couple of slides may hit on that a little bit. Uh, and if they don't, then uh, then just kind of pinch me and <laughs> and, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, sure, let's see. So I, uh, you know, so when we, I, and just a couple of the points that I made, I want to kind of uh, go into a little bit more detail because I think that that's important. So. I think one very important thing is to find excellent mentors. You know, I was very blessed to have a very senior medical pancreatologist, Dr. Peter Banks, uh, serve as my mentor when I was a GI fellow at the Brigham. He's the one who really got me excited about pancreatology, and I think that some, in some ways answers your question. Uh, I think he opened doors for me when I was a fellow, and he continues to open doors for me as a mid-level faculty member. You know, I, I think that uh, this goes back to some of the longitudinal relationships we have with the people who mentor us. He always insisted that we attend meetings in the field, and he supported us to do so. And really, I think he, you know, lives up to the ideal that uh, his fellows should accomplish more than him. Otherwise, there will be no progress. You know, I think that's a very important point. You know, when you look for a mentor, you want to look for somebody who really has a record of, of putting people... Uh, their mentees ahead of them, you know, allowing them to um, prosper and, and accomplish great things. And us often, or the men, you know, the mentors taking a step back and recognizing that we're only going to be as successful as the people we produce. And if those people produce more than we did, you know, and, and I think that's really, really important. And he was always very practical and realistic. So, you know, I, I think this is really the, um, you know, Dr. Banks was a person who really got me interested in pancreatology. When I was a fellow, I actually thought that maybe I would do work in notes because when I was a medical student, I took a year off and I did research with uh, Tony Kalu um, when I was a medical student at Johns Hopkins. And when I came into fellowship program, I thought maybe I would just do more pure endoscopic research and innovation and endoscopy and work with Chris Thompson at the Brigham, who many of you know, does a lot of work in bariatrics and does a lot of, and did a lot of work in notes, I would say maybe about 10 or 15 years ago when he first joined the faculty and when I was a fellow. But, I, you know, at the time they, they had a really good policy at the Brigham and that was that no, no mentor could have more than one mentee. And in some rare instances, they could have two. And unfortunately, Chris already had two mentees. <laughs> so interestingly enough, I came to pancreatology in maybe a more uh, roundabout way because I wasn't really thinking that this is what I was going to do. But it just goes to show that, uh, you know, some, that was, I think, a good policy that the Brigham had in place and how, you know, and sometimes some aspects of our careers we can't entirely always plan, but it ended up being the best thing for me, you know, having to, uh, had, having had to, um, you know, switch out or, you know, consider working with a different physician and realizing that, you know, he uh, wanted to make the room for another person to join him because the other person who was one of his fellows at the time that I became his fellow was uh, Bi Chin Wu, who many of you also know as being involved very heavily with CAPER, but Bi Chin and Wu and I were uh, co-fellows with Peter Banks at the same time at the Brigham. So just uh, sort of an interesting tidbit there. I also had a career mentor at the Brigham. His name was Jerry Trier. He's still working, believe it or not. He's in his late 80s, early 90s now, and still comes in a couple days a week and serves as a mentor to many people who are at various stages of, uh, of their careers, including many even senior faculty, who was a, a, a very, very easy to approach gentleman. Uh, you know, Dr. Trier is a giant in the field of celiac disease. So it's also interesting how people who aren't even necessarily in your direct career or research interest pathway can still be a, a vital resource to you. And, you know, he was the type of person who always had an open door policy. He always provided high level experienced advice on career and life. He met with me uh, one to two times every six months. And, you know, I found that to be very, very helpful. Um, so, you know, I, I think really hats off to Dr. Trier and for what he did for me and what he continues to do for many um, at the Brigham and folks in Boston. Um, so, you know, these are other factors to consider when you're choosing projects. You know, it's, it's really interesting. We don't really, uh, you know, we, I, I think when we're going through our training as, you know, no matter what stage we're at, whether we're medical students, residents, fellows, advanced fellows, uh, subspecialty fellows, we don't necessarily think about the, um, uh, you know, the types of projects we engage in, how much time they're going to take, their likelihood of publication, what it takes and what it, what it is ultimately going to be worth, right? And I, and I think that this is actually a very good slide because it, it helps you think of the kinds of projects that we get involved in and what their likelihood of publication are, right? How much time it's going to take. Because, you know, at different stages of our career, we're going to have very different amounts of time to dedicate to research. 
So, you know, I try to think a little bit about this when, uh, when my trainees come to me at different stages um, to do uh, research. So, you know, I have medical students, I have residents, I have GI fellows, I have uh, advanced endoscopy fellows, I have junior faculty who all want to do work, but, you know, at different stages in their career, they're going to have very different clinical commitments and other things that are going to be pressing on their time. So we have to think a little bit about what, you know, what, what's what are the best projects for people to take on. And, uh, you know, and I think this is always a good way to have the discussion with, um, you know, with whomever's your mentor or your research mentor in terms of how to, how to progress along and get involved in things that are actually going to have a higher likelihood of a, a publication and their subsequent impact. Um, my own fellowship project, uh, many of you probably uh, remember or have heard of the MOSAP database. This was a large prospective registry database of all the acute pancreatitis patients who were admitted or transferred to the Brigham between the years of 2005 and 2007. When I first started the project, we had only just a handful of patients, but by the time I finished in 2007, we had an, enrolled almost 400 patients into this database. Uh, and this led to many publications, including uh, many of you know about the BISAP score. So this was actually the data set that helped uh, with the validation of the BISAP score. Uh, early SIRS as a severity marker. Some of the studies that we had done on radiologic prognostic scoring systems, you know, comparing like MCTSI and CTSI back to some of these clinical scoring scales. Uh, as well as imaging utilization and comorbidity in acute pancreatitis. And, and what's interesting is that, you know, obviously many collaborations stemmed off of this effort, and it continues to be a resource um, for acute pancreatitis researchers. You know, despite the fact that uh, we're now so many years out, uh, this database continues to be used for projects, and, you know, fellows at the Brigham currently are writing papers, and they continue to include me in some of these projects just because of the work that we had started. Uh, and it's interesting because this has really largely continued and, uh, you know, additional patients have been added to this database over time. And of course, we know that perspective data is always the best data. So this, I think, uh, has been a, a really valuable resource for many and has really helped develop a lot of people's careers. So I remember we were talking a little bit earlier about publish at least one fellowship paper, uh, one paper during your fellowship uh, time period. Uh, and as you can see, there are, of course, many obstacles <laughs> and sometimes that happening, but I, I think it's important to do. Um, and, you know, of course, I think that, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of pressure, you know, to publish, um, you know, I think especially for faculty, but I think that when you at least start getting into the habit of, of getting involved in, in the publication process, I think it becomes easier each time you do it. So by the time, you know, you finished writing your first paper and you're now on your fourth or fifth or sixth paper, it starts to get a little bit easier because you know exactly what are the elements that are going to be needed in order to not only put your paper together, but also to get it through the peer review process and, and further yourself along, uh, not only in terms of your own accomplishments, but also getting you more involved in the research process. I, you, know, you know, I mentioned a lot about talking, uh, I, you know, I, I really try to get fellows to apply for grants. Now, of, of course, the first grant you may apply for is not going to be one of these awards, a K award. Um, many of you know that the K award is kind of the first step for uh, going towards, uh, you know, these are the really the first level of NIH career development grants that people try to get a hold of uh, before they may be able to prog progress on to a U or an R, um, you know, mechanism of funding. Um, and, you know, the only reason I bring this up is because, uh, you know, I think that uh, this is probably, uh, you know, I, I, this is probably to some extent underapplied for, you know, especially the, uh, the research one, which is the K-23. So you can see that, you know, while about 600 people applied, 203 people got this grant in fiscal year 2011. This is the, some of the most recent data that I could find. Well, you know, for a success rate of about 34%, which if you think about it, you know, the overall success rate for getting an R grant is about six or 7%. So when you, you know, if you're somebody who's, you know, done research as a fellow and, and you've, you know, worked with a mentor and you've published a paper uh, and you're oriented towards the clinical research pathway, you know, I, I do think these are, these are feasible. You know, they, you may not get it on the first shot, but I do think this is something worth shooting for, but just, you know, something to think about. I remember I was talking a little bit earlier about cognitive is forever and procedural is fleeting uh, you know, because of the disruptive nature of technology and innovation. So, you know, I just bring up one example. I mean, and I always tell this to my fellows. Remember that proton pump inhibitors replaced Bill Roth one and two surgeries for peptic ulcer disease 
probably sometime back in the 80s, right? Uh, and remember that now Poem is competing with Heller Myotomy, right, for achalasia. And in the old days, we only had dilatation and botulinum toxin injection. And let's also remember that, you know, a lot of things are changing. So I, while, you know, there are some centers that perform ERCP for SOD, uh, you know, we know that SOD is becoming, uh, you know, a, a less common indication for ERCP. And I also suspect over time it will be less commonly pursued for even idiopathic recurrent acute pancreatitis and pancreas divism. So, you know, while there are some things that we have been doing a lot of in our own clinical practices, I suspect that we're going to be doing a lot less of that as we move forward. What about EUS for the evaluation of chronic abdominal pain? You know, I think at some stage that that alone is probably not really going to be, you could argue it's low value care now. Uh, it's commonly done, but one, one could really, uh, you know, sustain with convincingly that um, we're not really too sure what the yield is that we're getting. What about screening colonoscopy? Hey, this is, uh, this is what's driven gastroenterology for 20 years now, right? I mean, since Katie Couric had her screening colonoscopy televised to national television and Medicare started reimbursing for screening colonoscopy, if you think about that is really the launch pad for gastroenterology in, in the United States. You know, gastroenterology used to be as small a field as endocrinology, geriatrics, and rheumatology. So can you imagine in the future, I don't know what stool DNA testing is going to do, um, but, you know, of course, some argue that it will just find patients who actually need colonoscopy to remove polyps. But at the same time, think about how many people are going to have a negative result and not have a colonoscopy. So, you know, just think about some of the forces that are coming in our direction. What about surgical ruin y gastric bypass? Um, you know, I think the time is not too far away where endobariatrics and maybe even some drugs. You know, we know that liraglutide, for example, has been approved for weight loss. Uh, you know, there is probably a not too distant future <laughs> where we are going to be using primarily drugs and maybe better diets and uh, endoscopy to treat uh, the morbidly obese. So, just some things to keep in mind. So, you know, you also want to follow the forces and challenges that shape GI and the position you want for yourself. You know, I, I think this, these are interesting articles. This was one that had come out from the AGA Institute looking at, you know, what kinds of things, you know, they, they're talking about some of the challenges that are and some of the opportunities that are going to be facing academic gastroenterology as we move into the future. Now, this report's already 12 years old, and I certainly, I don't want to dig into it. And I do want everyone to remember that I'm happy to share these slides widely. Um, but, you know, these are the kinds of things that it's good to keep in the back of your mind. I mean, again, you should do what you love, but you should think about what it is that you love and how it might change. Remember, we were talking a little bit earlier about GI divisions need individuals with all sorts of skill sets to be successful, right? So, um, you know, I think that, uh, and we also need people who have uh, skills to do lots of things. You know, we are, we're all, I think what all excites us about academic medicine for many of us is the ability to engage in multiple areas, right? Not only do research, but take care of patients, uh, teach the next generation, you know, get involved in, um, you know, the administrative structures of our institutions, uh, you know, work with the community. There's all sorts of, you know, ways to get involved. And, uh, and I think having skill sets in multiple areas is important. Remember, we were talking about protected time and support are, are more important than dollars. So remember that protected time and support lead to increased research productivity. That results in an increased impact and reputation. That results in all these wonderful opportunities to do things like consulting, advisory boards, getting patents, royalties, commercialization. That leads to money, and that gives you more protected time and support. When I mean money, I'm not just talking about money for your research, but also money for you. So you want to think about, you know, I think this is the long view on research and getting involved in research. Uh, so, you know, take the long view. Don't trade away your happiness now to earn money in hopes that if you make enough of it, you'll be able to buy it back later. Can't. So uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a very telling uh, quotation. So now these are some of the tips uh, to and during the junior faculty years. I'm going to go through these quickly because I know this may not apply to everybody on the call, but, you know, I think you want protected time. Uh, you know, I think the ideal job would be a 60-40 job for at least a three to five year period. Um, you want to continue to apply for grants. Early on, say yes to every opportunity to lecture, travel, write, serve on a committee, etc. It amazes me how many of my junior faculty, even at our institution, say no to these kinds of things. Because I can tell you, once you say no in the earlier years, it's much, much harder to get an invite to come back in the subsequent year. 
So, you know, I think early on, you gotta, you gotta kind of be a Pac-Man and gobble every opportunity that comes your way or a Pac-Woman. Uh, and with time, certainly, you know, and seniority, I think you can sort of cut back a bit. Uh, make your clinic and or, and or your procedures a vehicle for your research. Very, very important. You know, I, this is something that I kind of stuck to from the very beginning. I really tried to see, you know, everyone I saw in clinic, how do I, you know, how do I put together the documentation so that I have something that I can go back and look at and be, uh, and have a lot of information about that patient, uh, you know, that, because that really can fuel a lot of our research, especially our retrospective studies. Form a research group of trainees and collaborate internally and externally as much as possible. Find mentors to help guide you in new directions and with new interests. Look for ideas outside of what you would do, especially to address the big unanswered questions in your field. Build a program and schedule time for family, taking care of yourself, eating well, avoiding burnout, etc. Planning never hurts when you are a junior faculty member. So, you know, this is something else that, uh, you know, it's interesting how much is out there that's in the literature that we can look to. To think about, you know, how do we, what kinds of things do we want to do to help promote ourselves, you know, because some of this actually is very important as you start to think about academic promotion, right? So you become an assistant professor somewhere and you start to think about what are the kinds of things I need to do, you know, to ensure that when the time comes to be put up for promotion that you will be viewed favorably by the promotions committee. So these are just some of the things, I won't go into a lot of details about this, but just, you know, things you want to think about. I've had a lot of mentors since my GI fellowship. Uh, so, you know, beyond uh, my time with Peter Banks at the Brigham, who continues to be a mentor to me, I've, I've I in fact, picked up mentors and I've uh, continued some of the relationships I had with other mentors. So over here on the left is Tony Kalu. You know, I worked with him when I was a medical student. And he was a big reason why I came back to Johns Hopkins to do an advanced endoscopy fellowship. He was actually the one who convinced me to do an advanced endoscopy because I was actually thinking about being a medical patient pancreatologist and just sticking with that. But he said, look, uh, you know, we're thinking about starting a pancreatitis subspecialty program. It would be good if you could not only do the medical, but the endoscopic, it would help you take care of your patients from multiple standpoints and really get involved in their care uh, all the way up to the point of them needing surgery. So he was really the one who convinced me to do that. And then when I first started working with the surgeons, as we built our pancreatitis center, I started working with the folks here in the middle. The top is Dana Anderson. Many of you probably know him. Uh, he is now a program director at the NIH and IDDK, and, uh, but, worked was, but his last clinical job was at Johns Hopkins when he was the chair of surgery at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. Below him is Marty McCary, who's probably one of the world's uh, you know, leading uh, minimally invasive pancreatic surgeons, you know, probably only the second person in the United States to be doing the laparoscopic Whipple on a more regular basis, and the first person to perform a laparoscopic total pancreatectomy, and has really helped us develop our total pancreatectomy program tremendously before he stopped operating a couple years ago, only because he had a neck injury. Uh, Many of you know David Whitcomb over here on the right-hand side. He's a former division chief at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Um, of course, the discoverer of the, uh, P of the hereditary pancreatitis gene, PRSS1, back in 1996. And of course, has been a, you know, a huge uh, inspiration to many um, clinical and uh, laboratory pancreatologists uh, over his long, you know, nearly uh, three decade career now. But what's been amazing about David is I think he really helps everybody uh, even outside of his own institution sort of advance themselves in the field of pancreatology. The other person who I said would probably has become my greatest mentor in the last couple of years is Osborne Drews. He is the chief of GI at Alborg University um, Medical Center in Denmark and probably the world's leading authority on visceral pain and pancreatic pain. And that's an area that myself and many of my uh, members of my research group have been getting more and more involved in. And I think uh, Osborne Drews has been a, a tremendous asset uh, to us, not only from the standpoint of collaboration, but also mentorship. Um, and listen, it takes a village to make things happen. Uh, this is my research group, both current and, and former members. Uh, of course, every, everybody knows Venkat uh, and his wife, Aisha, who's one of my current postdoc fellows, and Maya Foggy, who I think is also on this call. Um, both of them are still working with me, but unfortunately will be leaving me soon. So if anybody else uh, <laughs> is interested in a career in academic pancreatology, uh, uh, 
they can also join this group. Uh, the person who's not listed here right now, but whose uh, picture I've got to get a, a better one of is Furkan Bular, who's also on this call. And Furkan, I got to get your picture up here. So I've got three postdoctoral fellows, uh, two who are imminently graduating. Tina Bordelari worked with me for a little while when she was a medical student. Now she's an internal medicine resident at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Nassim Parsa worked with me as an internal medicine resident. Uh, and is now a GI fellow at the University of Missouri in Columbia. Amitasha Sinha worked with me as a postdoc fellow and is now working as a geriatrician in Maine. And Neelofar Jalali worked with me when she was an internal medicine resident and is now a uh, chief resident at one of our internal medicine programs here in Baltimore. I've also had former pancreas fellows who've gone on to academic positions. Um, uh, Ellie Afghani over here on the right, many of you probably know her. Uh, she worked with, uh, she was my, um, my fellow from 2012 to 2014. And then she went to Cedars um, Medical Center in Los Angeles where she was an assistant professor for several years. And then she just came back to Johns Hopkins this past summer. So we're very glad to have her back uh, as a faculty member in our pancreatitis as well as our pancreatic cyst uh, uh, programs. On the left-hand side is uh, Robert Moran, who was uh, not only uh, a resident, but also a GI fellow and an advanced endoscopy fellow here at Johns Hopkins, and, and a pancreas fellow, I'm sorry, here at Johns Hopkins. So he did all of, all of his training here at Hopkins and worked with um, me as well, and is now a faculty member um, at Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. Now the other thing, so I'm gonna just finish up a little bit with um, you know, make, make your clinic your research vehicle. This is just a nice example of, of how we, you know, by keeping track of all the patients that we did genetic testing on since 2010, we were able to take that data and these very well phenotype patients only because we, you know, recorded as much detail about their visits with us as possible uh, to actually then that becomes sort of a vehicle for all of your research, right? And this was just a, a nice paper that we had put together looking at um, our are the results of our genetic testing in relation to uh, the phenotype of these patients that we had seen in clinic for a five-year period between 2010 and 2015. Many of you probably know about this manuscript. Now remember that experience and creativity uh, begin taking hold at the junior and mid-faculty stage. So you know when you're when you're a fellow you're coming out with all of this knowledge right over here on the left hand side. Experience is when you can draw connections between all the knowledge you've acquired and then Creativity is when you can take that to, to the next step and actually create wonderful, innovative, and you know, groundbreaking next steps in wherever we're going. And you know, and I think this is a nice way to think about it. You know, that's very simple and that people can understand. And so, I, you know, I, I think we always need to be thinking about how do we how do we acquire the knowledge and the experience to make true creativity happen. And one of the ex best examples of that, uh, of I, I would say in my career and uh, you know, up till now is really this chain of events. And one of them is when I was a junior faculty member, I actually took a course on systematic review with Dr. Milo Kuhan, who's probably one of the world's leading authorities on systematic reviews, meta-analysis and network meta-analysis at our school of public health in 2010. I took this course and I was, it was interesting because when I started working with him, I was like, wow, you're doing something called network meta-analysis. That seems really interesting. And I'd love to do it because I think I have a field where it could apply. And I was thinking in my mind that, gosh, you know, um, uh, we, have, uh, we have so many drugs that we use for post-TRCP pancreatitis prophylaxis, but we've never actually uh, had an opportunity uh, to actually study them all against one another in a network meta-analysis. And just one year later, uh, Venkat started working with me. Uh, he had just come from India, he had graduated medical school and started working with me as a postdoctoral fellow. And he was like, okay, I'll take this, you know, I'll take this bull by the horns. And he worked hard on doing this extremely systematic review. And he met with Milo a couple of times and we tried to figure out how to do this. And he published this wonderful paper in 2013, looking at uh, doing a, our first network meta-analysis looking at pharmacologic prophylaxis against post-TRCP pancreatitis. And what we found in this paper was that epinephrine actually ranked as the, um, as the most likely agent or the most efficacious agent to reduce post-TRCP pancreatitis rates. So, you know, that's what he showed here. You know, when you looked at the Rango gram, it was actually considered to be the best agent, even ahead of uh, NSAIDs and some of the other compounds that people were kind of entertaining at that time. And as you can see, here's a network diagram. So, you know, a pretty hef heavy lifted 
project on many levels to do this. So then we were thinking, huh, so we know we're using a lot of rectal NSAIDs and he, down here, you know, and that may be where this is working in the inflammatory cascade that is involved in posterior CP pancreatitis. Maybe we can also start to incorporate epinephrine too. Is it possible that we could use both? And that's in fact where then we realized that why don't we get a couple of centers together and see if we can actually do a randomized trial and, and look at both of these agents together compared to rectal indomethacin alone, which at the time was the standard of care for preventing post ERCP pancreatitis in patients deemed at high risk. So, you know, Venkat reached out to several centers in India. He had a longstanding relation with the folks at the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, and we got two other centers involved. And we did a study over two years where we recruit, recruited 959 patients. Uh, half of them were randomized to indomethacin, the other half to indomethacin plus epinephrine. And we found no difference. Uh, and we were able to publish this just last year in the American Journal of Gastroenterology. But the reason I bring this up is not so much the fact that we didn't get a you know, positive result, but to show you how we started off by you know, uh, getting some of that knowledge and then working through the experience of trying to test whether or not epinephrine works or doesn't work, and you know, really trying to put forth then the research and, and test it in a rigorous way to see if in fact whether or not it be an efficacious agent or not. But what we did learn in the process is that we got invited to do lots of other things, right? Because we did this randomized control trial and then, and then uh, Joel Munzer reached out to us in 2014, late 2014, early 2015 to get involved in the SVI trial. And that of course is now ongoing and it's uh, about, it just started its sixth year. And in this study, we're gonna attempt to figure out whether or not uh, indomethacin plus stent is non-inferior to uh, just indomethacin alone. So this is a, an important study that is now coming out of just all of that effort that we had uh, put in over really the last 10 years in, in getting involved in this. And we've got many other things that we're doing in post pancreatitis. Uh, and of course, I mentioned Osborne Drews a little bit earlier talking about, you know, chronic pancreatitis pain and some of his work looking at quantitative sensory testing. Uh, and um, and you know, I, some of you might know about the Raptor trial uh, that uh, is a new direction, but with some of the folks that I've been working with in this field for a long time, Beach and Wu on the left and George Paul Christo on the right. Uh, and you know, we had actually put in for a U01 to study IV fluids in acute pancreatitis. And you know, while this study didn't get funded, I, I just wanna show you that you know, obviously a lot of effort was put in and I just wanna you know, look at the kinds of dollars that we were proposing. Uh, to do this study, and maybe maybe that's why we didn't get funded. But the point is, is that how little things kind of lead to bigger things, right? So while this didn't happen, maybe in a couple years uh, with a little bit more data and impetus, we potentially could get this funded and, and completed. Um, one of the things I had also mentioned a little bit earlier is building a program. Uh, this is our total pancreatectomy and eyelid autotransplantation program working group. Uh, some of those folks in this picture have now graduated and moved on, but um, as you can see, uh, you know, uh, what had started as really nothing is now really largely built up into a, a much larger group of folks. Uh, and, you know, um, this is, you can, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but just kind of how some of the evolutionary facts around our total pancreatectomy and eyelid auto transplant program at Hopkins. I, I really like this. I don't know those of you know Dr. Bissell at uh, UCSF, probably one of the, you know, maybe, maybe one of the world's leading uh, basic scientists in hepatology. I just, I just like this, his five uh, home rules for the two career couple. I, I won't read them out loud, but I think they're, they're really good. And I, I kind of, I, I state some of these uh, uh, time and time again to my own fellows and trainees, because I think it's important, you know, uh, we don't live in a vacuum. Um, we don't uh, just come to work to work, you know. Um, I, everybody needs to live, everybody needs to uh, focus on their family and the things they enjoy doing. And, and I think it's always important to keep some of these uh, tips in mind as we work through our careers and think about what's important to us. Um, so, you know, five home rules for the two career couple. And for, with that, I will, I will stop and, uh, and hopefully just answer questions and chat with you guys. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for the excellent talk. You covered a very broad spectrum of topics with important lessons to trainees at all different levels. We will open it up for discussion and uh, participants feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question to Dr. Singh. And Dr. Singh, while the uh, rest of the audience prepares their questions, I have one quick question for you. 
Would you agree that some of the topics in pancreatology world is not progressing at an optimum space, uh, pace? And do you think collaboration between clinical pancreatologists and basic science pancreatologists are important? And you have done this before, uh, but is this an important thing to collaborate with basic scientists and how do we collaborate with them? Right, so all very good questions. I, I do think the, the biggest deficit in the field of medical pancreatology is the lack of a directed or targeted drug to any of the diseases that we treat outside of exocrine insufficiency, right? So in other words, if we have no pharmacologic agent to treat acute pancreatitis, uh, we don't have a directed pharmacologic agent to treat chronic pancreatitis pain, uh, while we have uh, enzymes uh, to treat exocrine insufficiency, one could argue that exocrine insufficiency is a lot more complicated than simply assessing for the presence of pancreatic lipase uh, in the stool, right, or any of the other enzymes involved in pancreatic uh, digestion and absorption, but also has a lot to do with our nutritional needs, right, uh, how um, our nutritional intake and intestinal adaptation to exocrine insufficiency, right? So it's actually a multifaceted. So, and that may be one reason why we're not really progressing. We really can't tell many of our patients what is the benefit of long-term uh, enzyme replacement therapy, uh, even if they have exocrine insufficiency, because that's never really been proven. And then of course, for diabetes, uh, we know we have insulin and, and other hypoglycemics, but uh, again, that's a complication of pancreatitis and maybe not pancreatitis at its core. Uh, you know, and similarly, you know, pancreatology is not just pancreatitis. I would say that is the, 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 the largest area. It also includes, of course, pancreatic cyst disease. Um, and, uh, and it also uh, includes um, uh, pancreatic cancer. But, um, you know, I think that's largely in the purview of oncologists. Uh, but of course, we have some involvement in that. Um, so, yeah, so that's, so I, so I think that's the top point is we're still looking for more medical treatments. Um, secondly, uh, your point about basic and uh, clinical, you know, scientists collaborating more in the field of pancreas is something that's desperately needed. I think there's only really a few centers in the country that have done a good job of recruiting both clinical pancreatologists and basic pancreatologists uh, in a way that, um, you know, in a way that can be fruitful moving forward. Um, and that's and that's important. And I think that that's another thing. You know, I had talked a lot about making your clinic and your uh, and your endoscopic work, um, your research. Uh, maybe it's just as important, especially if you're a junior uh, science. I mean, if you're a junior faculty member, to find a basic scientist with whom you can collaborate, or at least try to get some support early on, so that you can collect biospecimens from the patients you're seeing in clinic and doing procedures on, because that actually is a wealth of information that can then be used, uh, you know, to do translational research between yourself and a basic scientist. So, you know, I think that that is the type of uh, collaboration that folks in other areas of gastroenterology have done a much better job of than we have as pancreatologists. So when I think of my IBD colleagues, when I think of my liver specialists, I, I think they've done a much better job of, you know, creating programs where they're not only doing a good job collecting clinical data, you know, on patients uh, who are coming into clinic and having procedures done, but also they're creating these bio specimen repositories that they can then work with in conjunction with basic scientists who are interested in their materials. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's something we need to do a better job of. Uh, and I'm hoping and that, oh, you know, in the coming years, we'll have more centers that have the capacity and capability to do those kinds of things. Um, I also think that, um, we need to think a little bit more outside the box. So I think clinical pancreatologists can also think about working with biomedical engineers, pain specialists. And if you think about it, that's kind of how we're getting more involved with groups that, that do maybe more traditionally work in neurogastroenterology and visceral pain disorders. That's kind of how we got involved with Osborne Drews and he introduced us to uh, you know, neurosensory testing for painful chronic, chronic pancreatitis. I, you know, I think there's a wonderful possible collaborations that you can really engage in even if you don't have a basic scientist, you know, find an engineer, you know, find somebody who does work in visceral pain, um, you know, find uh, folks who are interested in GI pathology or pancreatic pathology. You know, there's all, there's wonderful ways to sort of do these uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary collaborations that, uh, that we all can, I think, uh, really benefit from in a tremendous way. 
Um, recently, uh, you know, we did a project looking at um, uh, you know, pancreatic atrophy with our, our radiology group. Uh, and simultaneously, we looked at those patients who had had surgery and had atrophy or didn't have atrophy and got our GI and pancreatic pathologists involved. So we could kind of look at the correlations between clinic, the, their clinical data, you know, the presence of atrophy on imaging, and then, of course, the histopathologic correlates of chronic pancreatitis, right? So all of those things, um, I, you know, I think, uh, again, are nice ways to work with some of the, the specialists who, are, who we work with. Uh, and I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Singh. You highlight very important things um, for collaboration with basic scientists, having a very good repository, a biorepository, and we should start focusing on that. Uh, and we will wait for more questions from the participants, but some of them uh, questions were sent to me. Uh, Sajan, do you have a question? Yeah, I just have a quick question, Dr. Singh. This is Sajan Nagpal. I'm a, I'm a junior faculty, freshly out of fellowship within my first year. I, oh, I am medical pancreatology and I am, I am running the program at University of Chicago. Um, so essentially, um, you know, one of the things I noted while I was looking for jobs was essentially that, you know, medical pancreatology as a field is, uh, is, is, is not recognized uh, outside of the bigger centers that already know this niche. Right. How do you see this you know, evolving and going into the future? And, you know, as, as, as a faculty member at, you know, who's just starting and essentially I'm the only one in the program who does this, what advice would you have for me uh, or any other, you know, fellows that are graduating soon and going into similar positions very soon uh, to plan their careers um, in a way that, you know, they are productive and obviously, you know, sought after um, at, at institutions that at this time may, not, may or may not recognize medical pancreatology as much. Yeah, no, you bring up, uh, well, first of all, very nice to meet you, and, I, and thanks for joining the call. You know, I, I hope we have an opportunity yeah, exactly. to support in person, Perfect. you know. <laughs> but I, I, your, your first point's a very important one. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's probably the larger centers that are going to have um, the bandwidth uh, to, you know, to incorporate or, you know, list of services of somebody who is specialized in medical pancreas. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, I think the field is growing and I think, you know, as long as we're training more people to go out to more institutions and coupled to the fact that I, I'm seeing, you know, the, the possibility of more medical treatments, you know, coming into, at least into trial uh, in the next couple of years, I think that all of that is going to probably lead to a, a big growth in this field. If you think about it, IBD uh, was nothing until Infliximab in 1998. So, I, and I think we haven't had that moment. We haven't had our pancreatology moment the way that IBD has had in 1998. So I want everyone to think about that a little bit. I think once we hit that, then I think this field will get much bigger, much quicker. But let's also remember that a lot of the subspecialty fellowships in the field of gastroenterology are unaccredited, right? So advanced endoscopy is technically unaccredited. Motility is unaccredited. IBD is unaccredited, right? The only thing that's actually accredited right now is transplant hepatology. So what I suspect is all of these areas, as we grow and develop, um, you know, the medical offerings, I think they will all grow. And of course, I think endoscopy is probably not too far from becoming, um, you know, accredited within uh, the subset specialty niches that are increasingly being common in endoscopy, right? We have endobariatrics, we have third space, we have pancreatic biliary, we have deep enteroscopy. I think there are a lot of areas of practice which are going to become increasingly specialized. Um, you know, as we move forward, and of course, within the framework of the of the larger, you know, to medium-sized academic centers. Now, you, you know, your second question on, on planning a, a career, you know, I, I, I don't know if you caught the slides that um, I had put up, you know, about just things to think about as a junior faculty member, and I will, it's very important to me that you all get these slides, so I will forward my talk to Venkata, and hopefully he can post it somewhere where you guys all have ready, ready access to it, because I think it's important, everybody should see it, so they can, um, you know, to take a look at some of the things I put there, but I, you know, I think a lot of those are probably the kinds of things you want to think about. You know, saying yes to everything, <laughs> making yeah. clinic and your endoscopic work kind of the basis for your research, you know, really trying to collect that data and organize it early. So then as you build with time, you'll just be fascinated with how much information you have. Um, you know, getting collaborators, uh, even if they're outside of GI or outside of a traditional pancreas space, you know, finding those collaborators, I think, is a, is a wonderful way to also, you know, uh, not only um, 
possibly get some money to help support some of your research, but also work with other people who may be thinking about your field in very different ways and very different directions. Uh, those are probably, and you know, and then of course, I think looking for some protected time, uh, you know, that's yeah. actually, that's going to be critical. And I think the problem nowadays that a lot of institutions, such a demand on clinical, um, you know, doing clinical work, that it's becoming increasingly difficult to protect one's time. But at the same time, if you don't put in some energy to find folks to work with who may be able to get you on some of their grants at five, 10, you know, percent here and there, then I, I think it would be very hard to, uh, to find any time, you know, beyond that. Uh, so that's what, that's what I really think is important. So, you know, find the collaborators who can get you some time uh, because that time is gonna be uh, critical. Even if you just get 5% here, 5% there, 10% here, you'd be surprised eventually that adds up to an almost a whole day, right? So, uh, so think, about, uh, think about that and, and work to try to find that, you know, uh, because that's time that's well worth it. You know, I find that a lot of us work at these great institutions where, where there's wonderful people, but we just don't make the time to go meet with them. You know, just write an email to somebody and be like, look, I think you do some really interesting stuff. You want to meet for coffee? <laughs> you know, you'd just be surprised. People are like, yeah, sure. I'll, be, I'll meet with you. You know, what are you interested in doing? You know, it's, I, I think that's the wonderful thing about being in academics. Uh, you know, Venkat's got a lot of experience with that. You know, I have to give him a lot of credit. You know, he's here at Hopkins and probably knows everybody at the School of Public Health and Biomedical Engineering. He knows all our surgeons. <laughs> you know, he's constantly uh, meeting with folks to help uh, further you know, some of our research efforts and just have a natural curiosity because these people lead you in different directions. Um, uh, similarly, Maya, who's on this call, you know, she's, she's met with some of the neurologists, you know, because we're interested in pain. So we want to see how neurologists think about pain. You know, they, have, they think about pain, of course, from the back standpoint, from migraine standpoint, whereas we're thinking about it from the belly, right? But there's a lot of really interesting commonalities to pain in general, right? So when you meet with them, you start to be like, wow, I didn't even think about that. You now introduce me to a, a new thought process, maybe even a new drug that I could try for my patients. An excellent example of that are these anti-migraine medications. You know, the anti-migraine medications are doing wonders for patients with migraines. And guess what? They may also do wonders for patients with pancreatic pain, both chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer, right? So again, if I didn't meet with my neurologist, I wouldn't maybe think about that, right? So, um, so I think, again, this is, this is how uh, I think engagement and collaboration are really, really critical. Well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Very helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? We have a very quiet bunch here. <laughs> you don't have to be shy. Hey, Dr. Singh. This is Chris Moreau from University of Texas. How are you? Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Hey, good. So we're, we're one of the groups that's had a biorepository for a little while. Um, uh -huh. Our pancreatic surgeons established it about 10 years ago. Um, with a lot of foresight and um, you know we've we've been able to get a lot of basic science work accomplished with that but we're really lacking in the area of a clinical registry so we're trying to get started and I had talked to Venkat about this and and you know took some advice from him uh, I was just wondering what kind of advice you might have for for somebody that's trying to get started with a clinical registry in terms of prospective data collection and how to make it easy for you to do that sort of in real time. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Uh, you know, though I I've been very fortunate because I've had wonderful research fellows, uh, you know, at different stages in their career, sort of you know come to me and be like, well, I want to get involved in research, and you know, one of the things a lot of them have contributed to is the building of that registry that we have here. Um, and of course, you know, I I think that there's kind of two ways to look at this. I think if you if you you know if every patient you see, if you kind of think about them. You know, for everybody who comes to me with chronic pancreatitis, I'm going to talk to them about, you know, you have pain, you know, how are you treating that pain, how long has it been around, you know, do you have any of the functional deficiencies associated with chronic pancreatitis, have you ever had surgery, have you ever had endoscopy, you know, I make sure that all these things are part of my note, recognizing that I may not have the time to enter all that data, but if you make your, you know, your notes as complete and as thorough as possible, what's interesting is that you can go back to them a couple of years from now and be like, wow, I actually pretty much recorded everything I needed uh, about this one patient, even though I didn't have the time to enter the data. What I think is most important that you can do if you don't have a fellow immediately working with you is just keep an Excel sheet with at least, you know, the name and the medical record number and what their overall diagnosis was, right? I mean, that's like three columns. So that eventually 
when you do have somebody who has the time to go back, not only are your notes uh, at thorough and include a lot of the important variables that you want, but on top of that, you've also know at least in a general sense, which patient has which problem, right? So, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I, with my clinic, I kind of started off by just looking at, you know, five or six diagnoses, you know, so everybody either had, you know, idiopathic <laughs> recurrent acute pancreatitis, you know, a first time episode, um, chronic pancreatitis, uh, or, you know, some people just came to me with, uh, you know, with one of the functional deficiencies, uh, you know, exocrine problems, diabetes, pain. Um, and, and then, of course, patients with chronic abdominal pain, you know, which, of course, it probably is the largest cohort of patients we see, right? A lot of them have functional disorders, but somebody else has labeled them as having chronic pancreatitis. So I kind of put everybody into one of these buckets. And the idea was, was that as time has gone on, we've just been able to say, okay, who have we seen with CP? Okay, let's just go back and identify that column on the Excel sheet. And then people were able to go back and kind of look at the, you know, the clinic notes. So I, I always have more, you know, uh, I always have my fellows and uh, advanced fellows and those who are rotating with me in clinic just make sure that our clinical documentation is good. It, it doesn't just provide for good care. It also provides for good research. So I think that's probably, you know, how I would start that enterprise of trying to improve the clinical phenotyping the patients are seeing. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, thank yeah, you so something much for to that. Something to think about. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sam, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. That, thanks. Thanks, Vikesh. This was an amazing talk. Thanks, um, Sam. So I think my main question is, you know, you one of the tips that you gave was say yes to everything. And I think starting yeah. out as a junior faculty member, I'd like to be able to say yes to everything. But at the same time, it's, you know, do you want to prioritize in terms of what's going to help your career the most? Or should you really try to do everything in the beginning? And I'm talking about, for example, reviewing when, you know, journals ask you to review papers for them or joining committees and those kind of things that may not directly affect your research productivity per se, yeah. but may be influential in other ways. Yeah. I, you know what? Uh, you, uh, it's a very, very good question. Uh, I would say that in the beginning, you want to be a little bit more yes. <laughs> and I, I completely hear what you're saying. The more you say yes to, you sometimes say yes to things that don't have an immediate impact on your research productivity, right? So if you say yes to reviewing your fifth pancreas paper of the month, right? Or you say yes to joining another committee that's going to have another web conference, you know, every other week. <laughs> or, you know, all of those things don't have what I would call that immediate impact on your research. But there's two, th there's two important reasons to do those things. One is that it makes you look like, uh, you know, kind of a go-to person, a collaborator, somebody who's open to sort of work to help, you know, with other aspects of kind of managing our field, right? So in other words, if, if none of us ever reviewed papers because we were too busy writing our own papers, we won't really, right? I, I think you could sort of broadly agree with that. Uh, if all of us said no to committees like uh, the CAPER committee or the APA council or the NPF, then how would these organizations move forward and secure research funding that enables us to do our research and bring everybody together for an annual fellow symposium and travel grants? And, you know, so if you think about it, uh, you know, all of these administrative, organizational leadership, you know, editorial opportunities help with the field. They help with citizenship. They make you look like a team player. And ultimately, I think they pay their dividend because people are like, well, Sam participates in everything. You know, let's get him involved in this research project. Or Sam, you know, Sam, or look, I, you know, I have a U01. Sam, you're seeing patients with acute pancreatitis. We'd love for you to join us and contribute patients and help write up some of this data when it's all done four or five years from now. You know, so I, I think you have to look at some, some things aren't going to have that immediate. Uh, and, you know, other things are going to have, um, uh, you know, the more immediate impact. Like, oh my God, I just finished all this data analysis. I need to write this paper so I can submit it, you know, and actually have a publication. So I think you need to look at short and long-term, you know, visions here. It's kind of like, you know, playing on a little league baseball team. You know, I, I remember uh, my little league coach always used to say, when you go up to the plate, you know, for those who are familiar with baseball, he was always like, I want to see you swing to try to get singles. Base hits are what matter at your stage. 
because when you're a good base hitter, those are the people who ultimately become home run hitters, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think the way you want to look at uh, early on, you know, when you're a junior faculty member, people are reaching out. They're like, Sam, I want you to sit on this committee. I want you to moderate another session. I want you to come out to this meeting that's going to be a five-hour flight in one direction, you know, <laughs> for half a day and then fly back and take the red eye. You know, it's painful, but at a, in a lot of ways, I think those are the kinds of things where you're – building your brand, your collaborative spirit, you know, your own, your, your contributing your energy to kind of further our overall efforts, if that makes sense. And it's hard to sometimes see it that way, but, uh, but trust me, I think for everybody on this call who's a junior faculty member or about to start a faculty position, I think it's a good way to approach things, you know, and you can ultimately back off. Now, obviously, if you have a big family commitment, you know, you're invited to do something and, you know, it's your kid's first birthday or, you know, it's your dad's 80th birthday. You know, you, you have to start to think a little bit about, you know, that there's not going to be a second time for those kinds of things. Right. But I think in as much as it's possible, I think a spirit of saying yes is better than saying no. Gotcha. No, oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Singh. We had a, you, this was a great talk and we had very good discussion. This will be recorded and will be available online and on social media. And I will also distribute your slides. And thank you again for being part of CAPA and talking to our trainees today. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a great afternoon. Enjoy the beautiful weather. And for the trainees, thank please you. stay back for a few more minutes uh, for, for those interested in talking about.